movement times. Yeah. I'm awake at midnight, so I mean... Just as a, it's yeah. like a tangent, right? For me... This is... Yeah. <laughs> for me what happens for me what happens with my bowel movements um is that like i won't shit for like four days and then one day i'll have like three shits in one day that's you see what normal. i mean that's is not, not normal <laughs> that is not yeah. okay then cool. again, I, uh, i'm an, <laughs> i'm super yeah, yeah. regular i'm like a 130 and a 730 <laughs> kind of guy wow clockwork you have like a timetable you, you keep crossing it on off. clockwork <laughs> <laughs> Legitimately, you can say your watch is by me. It's very. It's seven thirty right now, and I'm contemplating going to the toilet. Wow. Um, probably it's should have done right. that. No, we're we're before. all good. We're good. We're, we can, <laughs> we're good. We can break yeah. the cycle just I mean, for just now. <laughs> I'm fairly irregular when it comes to bowel movements. So, like, when I feel like it, I'm on the pooper. That's it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel like. <laughs> like well, I mean, that like one day. Within reason. That one day, I'll I'll be like. It'll, it's a regular when I go, but that you can like clockwork that one day will come. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, uh-huh. that's odd though. It's you shouldn't hold it that long. I'm not holding that's it. Right. It's just I don't have no I have no urge to go. Anyway, continue with your story. <laughs> All right. So so my bowel movement at two a.m. Um, I installed this app called Quiz Up, oh. and I I thought it was a quiz app that is multiplayer so you can choose your categories like if you remember like when i was when i was still young and i had hair where it shouldn't have been what and puberty right and um so and at that time there was there was a thing called stumble upon uh okay nobody knows what stumble upon is yeah no it's it's not gone anywhere it's like yeah it's like it's, it's like it's some still there. mythical yeah, beast no, that definitely run away. Know what that is, we yeah. definitely know what stumble upon is. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so so it's like it's. I thought it was like stumble upon, where you select your categories that you like, or or things that you think you know a lot about or want to learn about, and um, you take a quiz, usually against somebody else, against a clock. Uh, so right, how okay, it works yeah. is, yeah. So you choose like so so like Harry Potter, for instance, is the one I chose. Um, so you can either quiz yourself on Harry Potter the movie series or Harry Potter the books, which well, so are drastically... Sep- they have separate ones? Yeah. Well, so, they like, should, so shouldn't they, right? They probably, I mean, yeah. for example, should, yeah. I know everything there is to know about the book series, but I probably couldn't tell you, like, which actor played what or... Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? So probably yeah. it's, like, split up, like, Oh, which actor played this in the movie, and what spell did Harry use here? I would know the second one. I wouldn't know the first one. Ah, right. I mean? Oh yeah, there's yeah. a there's a completely different section for just spells. So like no. they they'll tell you they'll no. they'll have the spell written and ask you what it does, and then there'll be four <laughs> options for it. So yeah, so there's quite intuitive. Yeah. So like, I suppose. yeah. So um, so there's like different I'm categories. This so, right now. so yeah. So there's so there's um <laughs> there's a there's a literature section which has all the books, and then there's a movie section which obviously contains the harry potter movie series right um so i was doing the movie quiz and so once i downloaded the app so let's regress a bit and i opened it and apparently it's a whole freaking like social network where once you once you get past selecting your things it opens up your profile and you have like a twitter feed of things people have posted in in regards to all the quizzes they've taken so every quiz has its own profile page and like its popularity it's its own rank level and people who follow that quiz and take it and like people post on that quizzes wall so it's it's so it's not just a quiz extensive. app it's yeah it's facebook for quizzes it's facebook for it's quizzes quiz literally book. it's quiz book yeah quiz, that's what it is quiz so, space but they couldn't so that call was it a, that because it was probably trademarked. That was a panic attack. I was like, oh, I was just going to take a quiz and like on certain cannabis. But apparently it has a whole social scene. So never mind. I So I just like you can. So I discovered this on my phone and I go into a bunch of quizzes. So how the quiz works is that it gives you a time. It pairs you up. It tells you who you're going up against. So you have to log in with either your Google ID or your Facebook ID. So your picture's up on it, your name, your real name is there. You can choose not to display your real name. And it tells, like, it, it gives out your location. So uh, my name shows up and my, my country shows up. 
and like my rank level or whatever rank like you earn ranks like different titles for the ranks you reached in different things so i can choose to display that and so you you more than often know you who you're going up against like their rank the name where they're from so it's it's a nice neat feature and then you, the, you you're pitted against another person now so like the question comes up and the moment the options come up for for the answers the timer starts ticking down from 10 to 0 and the faster you answer the more points you get right the maximum being 20 and the lowest being like i don't know 8 i think i, I haven't like gone down to the wire that much right so is that because you're so you good have to be... or because you are paying attention um it's it's more like if you've already so it can happen that if you take the quiz again and again you'll probably get the same question again depending on what rank you're up against so if both people are ranked one they'll get all of the questions will be new to them right right okay but yeah. Yeah, so if you play it again and again, you'll rank up, you'll you'll gain XP, and you'll be presented with more new questions. But the the thing is that the person you're playing against, most often than not, doesn't get... So if you've answered a question, doesn't mean the other person has already seen that question before. So it'll present you the same question again, even though you know the answer, because the other person hasn't seen that question yet, Right. And also because you're in the same rank bracket. So it won't give you a new question unless you really need to answer it. What's so your there's a quiz speed aspect. MMR? <laughs> there, oh, For anybody MMR. who doesn't know, MMR is a, is a, is a measure of uh, Dota 2 uh, rank. It's uh, a yeah, match baking points, but it's not necessarily just Dota 2. It's in, it's in a lot of other games as well. People might know. Don't think it's called MMR there. There is a it is, hidden yes. MMR in uh, Heroes of the Storm. There is indeed. Yes. Fair enough. No, MMR is like an inside, like um, a developer term that was made public by by Dota. Whereas they used it to like actually actually get people to improve themselves or, or create competition. MMR okay. has existed since the olden times. Fair enough. They just haven't. Yeah, it's oh, like it was called, called dueling and jousting, and now we call it MMR. <laughs> Yes. 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 I wonder what um, King Arthur's MMR was. Seven. Probably not very high. Seven. Yeah. Seven. 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 Yeah. You know, it's funny. Alec made a joke like that last night, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I calibrated last night on party. But we'll talk about that later. Let's let's talk right. about this quiz app. So this quiz. So so basically, there's a speed aspect. So if you already know the answer to a question, and it's always phrased the same way, so you'll be the first one to tap it. Although they move around the position of the options. Are you okay? Something. Is there some sort of demon? You can just mute me for that part, okay? It's <laughs> <laughs> like definitely a demon. Wow. <laughs> that was a fine. burp? Was it a fart? I don't know. It's fine. It's fine. What happened? Okay. We shall. Cool. Summon the um... demon on the recording. <laughs> That's just what my bed sounds like when I get into it. Isn't Whoa. that weird? Whoa. I'll kill them all. <laughs> it's it's bowel movement day. All right. Um, so yeah, so there's a speed aspect, and the quicker you reply, the more points you get. Um, so you you go through the ranks, you get high enough, and so there's a rematch feature where if you lose the match, it gives you an option to have a rematch with the same person. Now the rematch feature is interesting because I think I haven't really paid attention to it as much, but it negates all the XP and like the score you gain for that match because it redoes it for the both of you. So both of the players have to agree to, ha to a rematch uh, before either of them leaves. And if you if both of them agree, you have the whole quiz again with different questions or probably the same ones. And so like if you lose, you can you can try and have a rematch. Right. Now, more often than not, it happens that people are sore losers because they they lost by a point or. The so last question, it, rematches. yeah, the keep requesting, or if if the if the score is really close, uh, the last question on each quiz is usually like a bonus question, which gives double points, so you can actually like pull the win, like as a wild card, and um, so sometimes that happens over and over again, where somebody shows somebody up again and again. It's happened to me where I've tried to beat somebody and it didn't work and they I eventually had to leave and like queue up for somebody else and uh, I've been on the other end where somebody wouldn't just give up they just wouldn't give up and they kept losing oh wow um, but unfortunately yeah. it doesn't record all those losses does it it does oh it does like, record it doesn't the losses. record 
Yeah, it does record the losses. Like it'll record it as a, as a single match, but it'll show up in the match history where like how many attempts it took you to lose. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. So so um this was one of those matches where um I beat beat this girl from um New Zealand who had a very Indian name. Um and which is understandable because a lot of Indians go to New Zealand. And yeah. um so I I beat her like five times and then she eventually gave up and she she disconnected. And then I discovered that at the bottom of the screen there's like this chat button. I was like, okay, let's just say well played and a smiley face, like, you know. Well good, played. Good so I, I clicked the chat feature and like the chat opened up and I and I sent her a message and like well played, smiley face, and I and I went on to do another quiz. Ah, she replied and then nice we got to you. talking. Yeah, she was like, oh, there's a chat feature. I'm like, welcome to the party. <laughs> I have no clue. Like, this is supposed to be a social thing. So apparently, if you can, like, search for opponents geographically, so you can search for people with similar interests around you. So nerd fests have, are, are possibly, a, like, what's what happens when people look for people who play the same quiz, like, within, like, a 500-meter radius. So it's secretly a dating app masked as a quiz app. Oh man! Oh, For people than, who have it's egos, it's better than the way around, I suppose, isn't it? Well, I think yep. it's a quiz app that has dating like integrated into it. Yep, which it's, is it's unusual. Really, it's a little unusual, bit. but it's really smart. It's a little bit well, unusual, but yeah, it is yeah. pretty smart. I mean, you, you like, have to appeal to everybody, right? I mean, yes, and it's it's like you're finding people through literal dumb. interests. Yep, and you can like people have ranks. People can actually say that they know something about their interests, and if you're matching, like. Like, people will definitely hit you up. Like, they'll Here's say, the okay, thing. we're close yeah, by. Should like, we meet up to have a coffee? Yeah. Here's yeah. the like thing. I feel, like, I feel like this is a yeah. thing that you, Blue Throat, would have been opposed to before you started using this app and had it surprised on you. Yeah, I think it's one of those I would ones have where been. you would have questioned it. I think <laughs> anybody would yeah. have questioned it. But I think now that you're a member of this, because I hear the excitement in your voice a little bit. I think now that you're, you've, you've already started using this app and... And you've met somebody on it. Now you're like, this is pretty cool. <laughs> this is pretty cool. It works. And the thing, uh, disclaimer, I haven't used it since I ta started talking to her. Because um, what happened you was, while we were talking, uh, I almost did. <laughs> <laughs> she's on my Skype, though. Oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, so what I was your username out here? I hope she's not going to like find this podcast. And... Oh, there's no, there's no username. I know okay. her real name. Yeah. Like... She shortened it, but she told me her full name afterwards. Okay. But yeah, it's yeah. part of her name, so I'd rather not disclose it. Yeah, well, that's, um, that's completely fair enough. Well, of I course mean. not, yeah. Plus, she's like four <laughs> years younger than me, so I'm like, okay. <laughs> she's, she's 21, I think. She'll be 22. Yeah, see, that's not weird for you, but that is weird for me. Yeah. I mean, yeah, once you cross <laughs> the threshold, so like... like I hate yeah, that. I was, once you've done the way. university thing... Yeah. Then it's it doesn't matter, yeah. I absolutely um, hate that threshold, by the way. Just want to say that. Yeah. But uh, can we continue? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so while we we were talking and like eventually, like she was willing to give me her phone number if I were if I were asked for it because she gave me her her WeChat ID, and like because she didn't have WhatsApp and I didn't use WhatsApp anyway. I like I stopped using WhatsApp a while ago. Sorry, WeChat. Um, like, yeah, like what is WeChat? Nintendo Wii. No, it's like uh, Wii as in W E chat. And it's like, it's something oh, that I think gosh. it was a Nokia initiative. The thing is that she, so she almost gave me her phone number. So we, we, WeChat is something that Nokia made in competition with uh, WhatsApp. And it's actually a pretty good app. Right. It works really well. Uh, but um, uh, the thing is that it doesn't really work in terms of it, if it, of its backend, because I tried to verify my phone number and it, I never got the SMS. So it never worked. So like I couldn't even get into the app. So um, um, so eventually like we got on Skype and while we were discussing, apparently this thing is, is also browser based. So you don't actually have to download the app. So you can play it from your browser and from where she was playing on and it's cross platform. No wonder she was losing again and again because I was already always tapping faster than her when she was using a mouse. Ah, uh, so you were cheating. I was, I was technically cheating. Hang on. Right. You, one more time, what were you doing? He was tapping so she on was, his phone because he was on his phone and she was using a mouse. She was on the computer. She was playing I on the browser. I don't think that's cheating. It's definitely stretching the rules. 
It's definitely a cross cross platform. It's really hard to get because like if you have a touch yeah, screen. Yeah, but that's not your it. fault that she was on her computer. You didn't know. Oh, yeah. You certainly took advantage yeah. of it. Oh. oh yeah, because here's the thing: we were okay with it because, and she was okay with it because she didn't know like you could play it on your phone because there was an app for it, and I didn't know you could play it on the freaking computer because apparently she preferred it on the phone, and I preferred to play it on the computer because I actually have a good mouse. <laughs> right. So um, uh, that was that, and um, we haven't talked since. Oh, well, well. <laughs> so you're saying there's uh, a limit to how many quizzes you can do with a person before they just realize you're smarter than them? I think that's what you're saying. I mean, did, you know, that depends this is on the, the thing, <laughs> right? This is yeah. the thing that I think is a definite flaw with this program, because yeah. you're con. How are you going to establish a good relationship with somebody when you're constantly destroying them with this? At Harry Potter quizzes as well. Well, yeah. that's and fine, that may but... be their chosen forte, Look, and then you're just breaking them. Yeah. And then well, they're all here's the thing, confidence. right? Here's the thing: Harry Potter is something that people bond over quite often. Actually, like there are oh, a yeah. lot of relationships that that bloomed from the Harry Potter fandom. This well, is the it's thing. probably very true. Yeah, I think you can say that a lot of things. But I don't think that it's the Harry Potterness of it. It's the absolutely. F- like destroying the person every single time like like <laughs> almost every time i would guess on this blue throat you eat, there is a clear winner there's a person who wins every time am i right oh yeah there's there's very well, few times where you can done, tie he's done the thing again and again and again yeah oh look like, at me but show like off big... because of my superior knowledge to play the game again and again and again and again oh yeah. yeah you can get like absolutely like you know the answer to every question but that that point is really far away even for like the movie lore um like i've i, I played the quiz like i think 86 times and i was <laughs> only 25 percent in nice okay so there were there were that's a lot of a questions lot of that i haven't seen yet yeah that's yeah. a few times you hit 86 so, times, 86 <laughs> times. I thought he was gonna say like 10 10 maybe or something 86 oh no times. yeah so hold on are you like times. a secret yeah. lover of harry potter i didn't realize this I'm not really secret. Like I like because I read the books um, before the movies came out. Like I read the first book, yeah. and yeah. I read the second book, and I was like, okay, I'll read the re- rest later. And then the movies started coming out, and I was like, okay, now I'll I'll have to complete the series before the movies are done. So then I read all of them before everything was done, and yeah. So I I, I, I was like the one person who who did both of them in tandem, and I was okay with either one being different. Here's the thing. Ex- I am famous in my family. Like everybody in my family makes fun of me for this whenever I tell them that I read a book, because um, they say, "Is this going to be another Harry Potter?" Because in my mm-hmm. fa- in my family, I'm famous for reading those books about like twenty times or thirty times each. Uh huh. <laughs> and they know I they have... know that I've done yeah. this. <laughs> I've done this as well. Yeah. I've so read like them once. the day that the seventh Harry Potter <laughs> book came out, I broke my thumb roller skating in middle school. And my dad took me to Walgreens, which is a store in America. I don't know if you guys know what that is. Yep, well, I do. It's like a pharmacy, do, but... right? Like a corner pharmacy. Yes, that's exactly yes. what it is. He yes. took me there to get um, a splint for my hand because we were going to the we were going to um, the doctor, but um, I needed something, you know, in, in between, you know. And I saw Harry Potter, and I'm like, Dad, I know I just broke my finger, and also I'm in a lot of pain, but can you buy me this book at the same time, please? Like, because <laughs> it had just come out, you know? This is like 2007 you're, you're actually, or whatever. You're actually kind of innocent on that, because um, um, I knew when the book was coming out, so I had it pre-ordered to be delivered day one on the day of release, which yeah. it obviously didn't, because India. ha <laughs> ha and um because amazon at that time did not exist in india right it was a really long time ago it barely Otherwise, existed that was like 2006 or 2007 yeah so um like the the fastest way you could have gotten it was like through like uh, alibris or like yeah. amazon used to be the only online bookstore that was in competition with a lot of people like alibris was the other big one and alibaba was the other big one they don't, yeah and so um we didn't have amazon in india at that time so it was alibris for me and they delivered like two days late, so yeah. I and oh, and the moment I got it, I binge read it. I never left it. I read it seven hours for straight, yeah. And like it went through the night to the next morning. I was I was with the book at lunch, and I finished it one full swoop. We'll have a Harry <laughs> Potter podcast. 
where we um sure where we tell blue uh, sorry uh drew about all of the uh books i mean i've read the books yes. i've not seen yeah. all the movies i will be honest about that i got most of the way through and then other stuff came out and i was more interested in other things because i think because i'd read the books you know and oh, I th- okay you know what i think the last movie was really good okay well, good to know like i just feel like All i right. read the books so i'd see like I, I knew enough about them that i knew what was happening in the movies and i i just never like i enjoyed the books they're really good reads and there was just other things that I wanted to see or other things that I wanted to read after that. And I just fell down a, um, like a rabbit's hole of other books and other universes and genres. And then I just fell away from it a little bit. Um, yeah. And I, 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 I reread books. I reread a lot of books. Like I think I've read most of the black library, the Warhammer 40 K books like two or three times now. And there is books mm-hmm. that I do that. It's just Harry Potter wasn't one of those books. And I'm sure if I picked it up now, that I would enjoy it again because I enjoyed it the first time. There's something really yeah. enjoyable about the books and about what they are and what they represent. And yeah. the fact yeah. that they link back to your childhood, which yes. you're like, I remember reading this. I remember where I read this the first mm-hmm. time and and what I was doing. And I, I remember where I was like reading the last book. I was in Alabama doing flight training. And Mm-hmm. I remember exactly sitting in the in my in the car driving from Alabama, driving from Mobile to Montgomery, and I read the whole book just like basically on that trip, that almost like you, but I did sleep and I did eat. And <laughs> um, but, but I did spend a couple of days reading it. But I did you know have a life in between the time I was reading right. the book. So what you're oh, saying yeah. is, when Harry Potter ate in the book, it didn't sustain you in real life. I definitely didn't. I'm a big, I'm a big dude that needs a lot of food. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, and I just, yeah. There's something, there's something very quintessentially nice about Harry Potter that links it with your childhood, and I think that's why they're really special as well. Not only because yeah. the universe is really special and and what they've made around it, but because it reminds you of what you did in your childhood. And things. So. Yeah. Something that I've noticed about books that I've read in my childhood is that if I read them today, I'm not really impressed by them. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I the guess. First book? What's the first book that you were truly, that you truly remember reading that was like an adult book? Do you know? Oh, an adult book. Oh, Like, like an, um... what you would consider an adult book, you know, like uh, Wind in the Willows or, you know, something, maybe something you did at school. Um, I haven't or, read any adult books. Or, you know, oh, like um, like a full book, like a Harry Potter or something like that. What's the first thing you read? Oh, what was that first? a big, thick novel. Yeah, you possibly. Mean, yeah? Not even. It doesn't even have to be over elaborate and be a big, thick novel. But, you know, something. It was Harry that, Potter. It was it Harry Potter. What about you, Blue? I mean, Harry Potter was among. So I had, like, this phase. Okay. So this is a bit complicated because um, I was, like, I started reading a long time before I went into boarding school. Because I was um I was the kid who would always wait for like the the biannual scholastic readers thing to show up, and um they'd come up with this catalog of, of like the books that you yeah. could buy, and oh, I was yeah, to take I it know, home yeah. and like <laughs> yeah tick like eighty percent of those books. So um I don't really remember that phase of mine, but I still have a lot of those books lying around, and my mom hates me for that because <laughs> like these are all gathering dusk. I'm like okay, and I and I keep telling her, like every year she has that like one day where she loses herself. Like these are taking up so much, so she goes mad over the books. Like they they're taking too much space and everything. So like every year Mom, I'm they cost using two hundred like, pounds. Calm down, I'm not yeah. throwing them away. <laughs> yeah. So so like like those books are like like the really old books. Like I remember I had like an origami book that looked really interesting, and like so those don't really count. But like 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 these old series books, like from like the Everest series and all of those. So like I used to read those, but I don't really count them as like my my first big book that really got me into reading like as as an addict yeah. um the book that did it for me was ironically uh an enid blyton book oh nice okay right fantastic um, five or it it was funnily enough it was it was a, a, a mix of so i started reading the five in a fix where okay. they are on this they go to the chalet on the on the mountainside and stuff happens 
with their dog and everything and i read that halfway and then i had to then i moved to boarding school and i forgot to take the book with me so it kind of died off for a while and then i was bored one sunday so i just wandered off into my school library and i see they have like all of them they have all of enid bite so they have the adventure series they have the mystery series they have secret seven they have famous five they have uh like they have like everything enid Blyton has ever written and i was like gold mine and it was a sunday i had at least 16 hours I hope you did I it with a little bit more enthusiasm than just gold mine <laughs> oh yeah i was trying to be i was because i was at that age where i was trying to play uh, cool trying to play it cool even but you're in a library yeah. by yourself yeah try and play cool in the yeah. library by yourself and the librarian yeah the, and, the li- and like it's a library i can't really like shout or i'll be thrown out and i really want to read the books <laughs> so um and i was like the only other kid like like there were two other like senior school kids like doing their research for like their projects and stuff and i was the only kid just wanted like i was like the odd one out like nobody could understand like if somebody was watching me they'd be like that's a fucking nerd in the making right there so <laughs> i i just walked over and i and i pulled out this secret seven book where they they build a light they find this kid in a lighthouse right oh yeah they they built a lighthouse and then they find a kid there so um so that was like a really really cool thing so like because enid blyton um wrote books about kids that had way too much privi- way too many privileges like these kids could do anything that they wanted like they built light like like um like a like a tree house on their own they could they went on trips to mountains and like so it was like the fantasy things that kids really want to do when they're in school but they can't because they either don't have the time or the money or the friends to do it with and Enid Brighton was that escape for me where like she had like famous five always went like this through these like sensational adventures and um, god so sorry demons wonderful demons <laughs> <laughs> i'm so sorry i forgot that i was on live chat on my pc I uh so yeah so it was like it was a great escape for me and then like i remember like carrying those books in line for dinner and everything through through boarding school and, like pe- i was like it's the thing with it's also a thing with gaming as well like you always spend your time in front of your computer and like everybody looks at you and says this guy has no life it was a, it's a thing with reading as well like you are always seen with a book yeah. absolutely always yeah, definitely i think a lot of people have that and i am very much the same as you and i think it's a very i think it's a very good thing to have i think very much it's amazing yeah, yeah i think so Cause... i think mine was the hobbit i think my I, as much as i read the enid blyton books and the lion the witch and the wardrobe wardrobe yeah the wardrobe wardrobe the wardrobe, the wardrobe. <laughs> the wardrobe. hello wardrobe. my name is vladimir and i like wardrobes <laughs> um, like I, it was um, definitely the hobbit that was my favorite like my first one i remember reading cover to cover having you know, actually hand. i remember now that i um as a kid i read the the boxcar children books you guys know what that is oh yeah i know yep. i don't actually and, um well they're books about these kids that solve mysteries basically right okay so very much like the did blighton series and yes Yes. Oh, um. Now here's the thing. For some reason, I really liked the Boxcar Children books. Later on, mm-hmm. a few years later, I tried reading the old Hardy Boys books, and I just couldn't. I couldn't read them. Oh my, no! <laughs> my my <laughs> uncle got me like ten of them, like just for Christmas one year. I didn't even ask; he just got them for me. And I didn't like them. I didn't. I don't know why I didn't like them, but um, yeah. Um, I think there sometimes, are books like sometimes that. you you get books like that, and. You, and I, I think especially when you're older and you're more critical about what you like and what you don't like, I think there's certainly very different styles that you just you can read the first chapter of and you're like, oh, I just know mm-hmm. I'm not liking this. And you may yes. fi- you may finish it because you've been told it's a good read, but um, you just inherently know that you don't like it. <laughs> or there's no, I didn't enough. just finish it. I read four of them oh, before geez, I decided. Well, I mean, yeah. that's commitment. Wow. That's a nice commitment. To, that's, yeah. to well, he bought it for me for Christmas. I wasn't going to just well, shit all over it. Well, you could have used helps. it for firewood or something, you know? Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's plenty of other things you could have done with it. But, yeah, I think I think you find out you're way more critical. Especially, I think, I think it's one of these things where you're, like, a bit more adult and you read something and you're like, that was rubbish. Or, like, you read the first chapter and you're like, nope. This isn't for me. <laughs> and even though it might be a subject that you really like, you're like, this writer is awful. 
And then you come back to it a little while later, and you're like, geez, the story is actually pretty good, but it's just not the style. I, the style I just don't like at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another thing that I wanted to talk about, and um, we've actually really been going into the, the book stuff in this podcast unexpectedly. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's better um, than the pooping that we did at the start. Definitely. Um, the thing is, yes. I um, I was I said a couple of minutes ago to myself, I said, I'll save this for another podcast. But actually, we've been talking a lot about books, so I'm going to go ahead and start talking about it. You guys read Ender, Ender's Game, those series? I, yes. I have not actually, no. I mean, I've I seen have not the read movie. It. I've, yes, I have. The movie you haven't read. Yeah, I've I haven't movie, read the yeah. books. And if I'm honest, I'm ignorant and didn't know that they were from a set of books. I mean, I should have realized that. Um, well, actually, the movie is from only the first book. Right, okay. Um, yeah, here's the thing. I, I um, Sorry to interrupt you, but I have to say this, that uh, I was watching the movie online, right? Piracy! And um, because it never released in my country. Yeah. Well done. Oh, yeah. So... Um, I, I was watching the movie online and halfway or about 40% of the movie through, right? I got suspicious. I was like, this is a way too good story for a movie. <laughs> it's way too, it's way too in-depth. I think, really? like, I think there's you no follow up. that, yeah. Yeah, uh, like there's, there's no way that like a movie can exist on its own with such a deep framework of, yeah. of a universe without having like a prologue movie or like, being part of a universe i paused the movie and i googled it and i found out that it was from a series of books and i think yep that now it makes and, sense and i just re- then it, and I started watching it again <laughs> and the thing is the thing is i can't believe you got that vibe too because a lot of people complain that the enders game movie changed a lot of the stuff from the universe as well of course they did well i mean okay not that much but they changed some of the core principles some of the mm-hmm. big stuff it's it's not like they changed they, they included a lot of stuff that they didn't have to really and mm-hmm. I appreciate that, but they also did change some stuff. Um, I would recommend reading it, uh, at least the first one. And no, okay. If you get to it, and you, you you get to it, we can talk about it at a later date, I guess. It's sure. I think it's worth having a whole conversation just about that book. That's how good it oh, is. Oh yeah. I mean, um, we could do that definitely because I mean, since we're into books, like, um, I think it's probably because. Yeah, I think it's probably like a uh, we we chat so much about games constantly between the three of us. Yeah. To find another That's, point of interest. Yeah, and I think That's so, nice. and I think it's a nice thing to kind of round us into because um, a lot of people that speak to us or know us, we talk almost constantly about games and what we're playing, and what we enjoy, <laughs> and why we're so yeah. bad at them. Um, and on this week, it's mostly <laughs> about Dota. Yeah, yeah, it is mostly about games and uh, and about you know the games within the games and the games within Dota and the things that we play and what we like and dislike and enjoy. And I think books are always that. I don't know. It's weird, but they they used to be a bit of a taboo amongst gamers. You wouldn't really talk about liking books as much as you would talk about liking games. And I think that's changing now. I think that people are more open to the fact that other people like other stuff away from games. Right. Yeah. Like you like these people the that, thing, that um... enjoy RPG series and and like Dungeons and Dragons, and people are just a bit more vocal about it than they used to be. Oh yeah. Here's the thing. Here's how it changed. Here's, here's how I saw it changing. Um, because um, unlike a lot of other people who, who harken back to their early gaming days, citing how they became a gamer, they always quote saying that their golden moment was getting their first console, like the Commodore or, or the Nintendo or the Super Nintendo or the GameCube. Oh, gosh. And um, yeah. And I'm I'm one of those kids because I was, I was born in the late 90s. I was born in 1991 and it, it was 90s. that thing it was fairly late i mean if i if i was born like four years later even then i was i wouldn't have been considered as like even a legitimate 90s kid right i, would, I was I would have born missed. four years later and i consider myself a 90s kid but only just like only just yeah <laughs> only just like, and that's because i have distinct memories of hearing like uh, na- like bare naked ladies in my mom's car when i was three years old so <laughs> <laughs> oh wow so anyway, right. continue. <laughs> so um, so yeah. So but in the nineties, like I was born in a country where, like, tech and like video games were the things that you would buy from like a local thrift shop, that you would connect to your piece, like your your television set, and you used to get like these pirated cartridges to put in, <laughs> and 
they were they were definitely not made by Nintendo. They were like these Chinese knockoffs that you could plug into any TV you had, um, and you it would have like it was basically a, a plastic box that had the Nintendo emulator inside on a chip, and right. they gave you the cartridges with that set. So you can't go out and buy another cartridge. You just have the cartridges you get with that set, and if you're lucky, you'll find somebody selling cartridges for that kind of a system. So that was my first kind of gaming system. Whereas I was really jealous of one of my cousin brothers who is now an astronomer. Did he um, have a genuine NES or something? He had a genuine NES. And I was so jealous of him. But like, he was such a good guy. He's such a great brother. Like I, I, the one time I got to visit him, he was like, I've got something for you. And he, and he took me to his room. He was like, I know you're going to get bored outside. So I'll stay outside. You can stay in my room and play, play on the Nintendo all you want. And I was like, yes. Wow. <laughs> so like, yeah, that was, that was good. So yeah. Like my own self, like I started like from there, I straight away, like my dad got me my first computer when I was in the first grade. And this was like a, a compact home PC with like the, the, the extra additional features, which were, which were the speakers on the monitor. And it was such a big thing at the time where you can only get Doom and Shadow Warrior that run on DOS as a game. Right. And it was such, I was like the only person in, in school Bear in mind, I was in first grade in Vietnam. Another story for another time. All right. Holy shit, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Laying all this <laughs> stuff all over me, man. Yeah. So a lot of things. A lot of things. So um. So yeah. So this was um in 1994 or 96. I don't remember when I was in first grade and I got my first computer, and that's when gaming started for me in earnest. Where I was like, oh, my first game was Dangerous Dave, this MS DOS game, that was really popular and you can still get it today for free i think there's a flash version of it now um and then like some guy from like where my dad used to work who's in it gave him a cd of like doom and shadow warrior the the really first ones and i played that and it was like yeah it was so good donkey kong through an emulator on the computer yep that's how my gaming started now the point i was going to make was that coming around after like this whole big tangent <laughs> was um, yeah, I'm still here <laughs> um, that <laughs> video games used to be in those times and for for a very fairly long period after that um, just about the gameplay you played the game because it was so interesting because the character was awesome and you could do awesome stuff in this virtual world it was very rarely about the story and like actually paying attention to why something is happening or why the billboard or like the note has something to say, even though those games existed. But those were like the really, really down marketed, really, really nerdy stuff that didn't get a lot of exposure. And like Doom in itself had like a really simple plot. Demons are loose, kill them all. And then you win the game. There was yeah. no real story to it. Brandon's right. stomach and is loose. Well, this is, this is what a lot of the games in the 90s and the 80s were like. It was yeah. just like, uh, you're Mario, there's a princess, you save her, that's it. <laughs> like, yeah. which did you we never ever get to. stop to ask if Mario was the bad guy? No, we did not. Yeah, we just assumed we did not. the plumber check out game theory. Good <laughs> check out guy. game theory. Maybe, maybe if you check out game theory, uh, there is maybe yeah. possibly a theory about that, but continue. Yeah. So so basically, it was an active. So, video games were an active mode of entertainment, an active entertainment, uh, whereas books and reading was considered a passive mode of entertainment because you're only getting information that you are processing and you're not actually interacting with whatever the book has to say. You can't change the outcome, or at least you're not even participating except for just like reading or translating or having your own perceptions. Um, the it has slowly changed like when people started adding story or a plot and a single player campaign to games where they started to collide and people started enjoying those kinds of games where ooh story really matters and it can make my active viewing and entertainment experience better and so that's when the shift started happening when wolfenstein came out where there was an actual lore behind the reason you're killing these nazis there was an actual historical background which the gameplay was based on and then people followed suit with with different kinds of games and different genres erupted from where stories enabled you to do s different things with the kind of game you wanted to make and slowly and so forth story and plot 
um, kind of encroached upon video games so much that now we have games like Dear Esther and like um, like literally games where you don't have to actually do anything, just experience what the story has to tell you. And it's actually gone the reverse where a video game is now a passive experience, can be a passive experience, and an actual book is is much more engaging uh, in think, terms of its, do you its think actual this will content. Continue to increase with the the VR and the things there. Do you think the VR will uh, make that I you think, know bring them in line? I think the important thing about these games being um, these story games like Telltale games and things like that is that yeah they are linear. They are it is a passive experience, but they give you the illusion that you're making choices. So it like, gives you, you like the illusion f- of depth behind your own. It does. It does because here's the thing: if you play a game like, well, The Wolf Among Us is a Telltale Games story game, right? Um, mm-hmm. If you play that game and then you play it again, it's like looking at it in 3D when the first time you only had a 2D perception of it. You play it again, you make different choices, but the same stuff happens. Do you see what I mean? Yes. So the first time you feel like you're choosing. The second time you realize, no, I didn't really choose anything. I think that the reason that people play these story games is because they have the illusion of choice. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I think yeah. so. I think it's also like the um, almost like the choose your own adventure books to a certain extent, where yeah. you realize yeah. you, you you know, or or Zork or some of the old original. It's basically a better version of the choose your own adventure books because yeah. the choose your own adventure books are kind of clusterfucks, aren't they? It's like yeah, there you is... can't. Unless you write them down, yeah, you're going all over the place. Yeah. yeah. How did I get back in this forest? I don't understand. <laughs> uh, then you realize, Turn like, you realize, like, and... thirteen p- page turns later is that you actually did one wrong, and you're like, oh yeah. no. And you died, <laughs> and you died because of it, or something like that. And you yeah. died. Yeah, yeah, I think, and I think the um, I like the Telltale games because they're re- well, they are a story, they are a narrative, and and that's the key to mm-hmm. them. Um, yeah, and that's why they do so well. But I think that the um, and they're very akin to going back to the choose your own adventures. You're right, or the sort of Zork uh, style of game where you used to type in turn left or turn right, and you're at the side of right. a house, and you had to to find it. And the Zork was a narrative game where you made choices and explored, but it was a finite world with a finite number of choices and a finite thing. And there were very similar kind of games where you you won the game by just at that time making the right amount of choices at the right place or even like daggerfall Do you yeah remember daggerfall? very much yeah daggerfall was the npcs existed right they all existed in their own places but the world was procedurally generated nobody would have the same world as somebody else you know so cool that i mean I, i've never heard of daggerfall but that it's sounds a, like a really neat idea it's an elder scrolls game it, it's the second elder scrolls game oh okay yeah, I'm not really into Elder Scrolls. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um... I think, you know what, the amazing thing about games at the moment and, and, and books and everything is the amount of choice that we have before. Yeah. yeah. And the amount of availability we have of choice. And so you can go to Kindle or you can go to the Amazon store or you can go to the iPhone f- book store, which is called iBooks. Yeah. If I remember iBooks. correctly. <laughs> And there's so much choice in all of those categories, as well as being able to get your hands on physical copies. And it's the same for games. There's so many platforms you can get games or experience games on mm-hmm. now that really yeah. spoil for choice. But it's that choice that allows you and everybody else to experience their own way of playing different things. Or, you know, <laughs> filling that gap of just Enid Blyton books or... Um, yeah. you know, reading the Harry Potter series, you can now play a game that puts you in the universe for it, or and allows actually, you to go through it. Yeah, it's funny yeah. that you mentioned that because um, pretty recently um, Sips, Peary, and Flax and Lewis did a podcast. It was called Yeah, Trifles. it's a phenomenal yeah. podcast. It's incredibly funny. I, I yes, really, yes, yeah. Really, really enjoy but it. it's funny that you mentioned that. Um, do you think that we're in a sweet spot, like Lewis said, where? You have choice, but you don't have too much choice, and that in the future, everybody, you're going to have too much choice, so much so to the fact that, that you'll be playing games that other people that you know don't play. It's like it's like everybody has their own set of games, and you play a new game every day kind of thing. Like I, you... I think people play what they like, right? Because I think that there's things that I play that you guys don't, and there's things that that a lot of people play on this channel, like uh, Dota 2, that I've just com- gone completely off of at the moment. 
and I have sort of filled that gap with other games. And I, I think everybody will. It's like food. Everybody has their own favorite dish, and that they will always go back to their own favorite dish. But it's but you'll never stop having meals with your family. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't. Here's the thing. Yeah, it doesn't um, matter what those meals so, are with your family, but you, 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 still have meals with your family. And I think that that's why there'll right. always be people playing together on games. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. Like, um, getting back to the original point, you asked that, um, is this trend going to continue where like story encroaches upon like the active experience, and and like how VR is going to enable that a lot. Um, you, I think you kind of answered the question on your own where you said, um. Uh, that the um, the experience is going to change only because the mode of delivery of the experience is going to change because of VR and because right now you can either experience a story or content through a screen and a keyboard and mouse or through VR or through just reading the book or just listening to somebody reading a book or a story right. to you and it's just the, the mode of deliverance of that media so like if you if you are in in a um let's say you're playing a harry potter game on the computer you're you're walking around hogwarts and you're doing stuff you're, you're casting spells and that was cool because um uh you could like in the movies or in the book you were limited to your imagination when in case of the books mostly to imagine the structure of the castle and how the stairs go to different floors and how the floors would look and how the corridors would look and in the movies, you get to see sections of each of those floors and stairs and what are the sets that they built. But in the video game, you can go wherever you want because yeah. they've mapped the whole whole world for you. So this... you can go around Hogwarts wherever you want. So it's just that freedom of, of like being able to take it in. The specific and game that's... I'm thinking of when you mention that is um the fifth one. Yes, the, the Art of the Phoenix. That's when they did the extensive uh, scanning of the whole set that the uh, the movies created and um, they recreated the whole thing virtually so that people would walk around and do everything and um, that's the other thing now how that changes when you go to vr is that either you can do the same game from a different perspective with controllers in your hand and you get haptic f feedback when you do stuff or you can have somebody completely take over the fact that you actually do not have to control anything you can just move your head around keep the controllers in your hand and they can use the haptic feedback to give you a sense of what's happening when they say it happens so you can listen to an audiobook of harry potter and when they actually say a spell is cast the effect of that spell like like there's, there's a particular yeah. scene where dumbledore casts a spell at voldemort and he, they describe in the book how the emanating spell has so much force that his hair stand on end so they can they can actually use haptic feedback in the controllers that you're holding to express that fact. Yeah. yeah. Instead of and you actually having to do I anything. Think, I think it goes into and if any of you guys have read this Ready Player One. Um, oh, I book, haven't read it yet. Yeah. The Ready Player One. Either of you. Yeah. I haven't read it yet. I know okay. about the book. Yeah, you know about it. Right, fine. You uh, well, you need to pick it up because it's phenomenal. But uh, in this okay. in this one. I'm not going to spoil it. There's nothing. There's nothing in the spoilers, but it's a very clever piece of of um, thing where the people are wearing VR headsets in it, and they are, like you very much say, haptically in it. But they're reciting lines of a movie, and he's in. They're actually in the movie as the main character, where you have to say the right lines at the right time to progress through something. Oh and wow! I, oh, that's and, a cool idea. And it's yeah. such a clever and cool idea, and you could imagine that even doing it as your favorite book or you know, a short story or anything where you're in there and you're reciting the right lines for the na narrative to progress. You know, you know what Harry says next and you say it out loud and then you suddenly realize that you're in it. Um, or the movie. Yeah. Um, and the movie doesn't progress until you get it right. And I, I think it's a very clever idea and a very um, hopeful mm. way that we can sort of introduce a fourth dimension into the way exactly. we watch or experience things because you well, add it to exactly. that physical aspect mm -hmm. do you know yeah that's how yeah sorry no no go on go on um i was just gonna say this, like that just reinforces the point where where i was saying that like it's the mode of delivering that content because like either you can be involved in the content you're consuming by being there virtually through a keyboard and mouse and a screen in front of you or you can actually be 
the character saying the lines because like when you're playing a video game on a, on a computer you're you are controlling their actions but not their dialogue but this way you are physically present so they take away some control from you that a certain user might not like to have but they might really want to be in their shoes saying the actual stuff that makes yeah. a difference yeah i think yeah and, um, so it's just the yeah, think, yeah changing the mode of experience i think the the reference they use this way uh, in in ready player one is uh, matthew broderick in war games if i remember and he has to repeat the lines of what matthew broderick's character has to li- has to do and he's he's in the rooms that matthew broderick was in and he has to say it whereas he can't control what matthew broderick does he doesn't walk around and pick up the things yeah but he can deliver the lines of it yep yeah and i think that's um, just, that's it's such a hopeful medium going forward that you can really be involved that's so, so good, yeah. Yeah, and I think going back to what you said about um, you have these two different kinds of, of VR that you can do um, in today's current technology. I think that's part of the problem, right? Like, there's only two ways that you can... You'd either have to have a completely empty gymnasium available to you, right, with this VR setup in order to actually yeah. walk around the castle, right? For the For the HTC Vive, yes, you would need that. Yeah, yeah. Or you would need to have some way of interfacing yourself so that you feel like you're in the game, right? And this is something that we can't do. We can't directly Mm. interface to our brains yet. This isn't, we can't. Like, no. So this is why, this is why you have kind of limited VR right now. And the way that the HTC Vive gets around that is usually in these games, you have to teleport around. You just click where you want to go and it teleports you there, you know? Or yeah. sometimes it'll walk you there. But yeah. the point is that I think that VR technology is being hyped up a lot, but it's not really at the stage where we can fully feel like we're integrated into the game. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I Here's think so. Thing. It gives you the, the, um, the illusion of you're in it, and it hasn't quite got to the stage where yeah. that illusion matches up with perception. Right. Yeah. Also, here's the thing. I'm not... Here's the thing. I'm really not a fan of VR. Me either, and I don't actually. think... It's it it will get dwarfed by what Microsoft is doing with Hololens, because the answer is AR, it's augmented reality. Yes. Um, because VR has a fundamental problem where you have to take control of everything, and it's just not possible. You cannot change the world around you, because you are it's VR. You are blocking line of sight. You are trying to fool the brain into thinking that you are in a different place, even though the subco- subconsciously, you know you're not. Um, AR uses the existing reality and overlays on top of it. So you, your brain subconsciously more readily is, is able to accept the physicality of the place is not changing, but what is happening through that physicality is much more easier to perceive and believe so that you can have the wall in front of you have a hole in it and something come out. And... If you wanted to have that that experience of going through Hogwarts, a place would only have to make the set without anything on it, and then have people walk around with Hololens on the, on their heads. Yeah, so, so then the other people in in the in, with the Hololens on would be the students in the castle. Exactly, you would have everybody in uniforms appear out of nowhere, and then you could so, actually bump into them and things like that. Yep. So. Yep, you can have somebody just appear as, and you can just have Hololens just have. Uh, just have like Dolores Umbridge just walk past all of you because you can like literally avoid different because like you can literally the, the HoloLens knows that some there's another entity walking past you like it can see it has cameras VR can't do that yeah. it knows there's a different entity so it can project on your screen a virtual Dolores Umbridge this just walking really through why, the why are you concept? choosing the worst person <laughs> because, because surely, that's the one that'll have... surely they're gonna get the shit kicked out of them if they select the skin character Dolores. Oh, <laughs> well, no, this Hogwarts. is the thing, right? Actually, they wouldn't, would they? This is the thing. It would be like a theme park where you would have like actual yep. hired people that are playing existing NPCs, and oh yeah, Disney would do it. Yeah, Disney would absolutely. It. Well, it's not Disney; it's Universal. But yeah, you're you're absolutely yeah. right. They would. You're right. They like, would. Imagine... They would have. They would just have like. The, the actual teachers being hired actors that, that put on these hollow lines and walk around and mm-hmm. be those those teachers. And it's pretty interesting, yeah. actually. Like, you can do so much with AR. Rest it's, in peace, it's Alan so Rickman. Good. Rest in peace. Rest uh, in peace, Alan Rickman. 
So good. I'm still waiting for that Alan Rickman GPS. Still waiting for it. But yeah, I, I think it's amazing what you can what we're what we're now on the cusp of, and I think that's the exciting thing because we're getting close yeah. to the bit where games oh, and books are becoming integrated um, to an extent, or could be to an extent where they have never been before. Um, when did Alan his... Rickman die? What, like two months ago? Last year. What two the ago, fuck? Think, yeah. Hold on, I have to deal with this in, in silence. <laughs> he, do- he didn't know. <sighs> I have to deal with this in silence. Continue. All right. Okay. Sure. So we're moving I mean, on to, to our next topic, and that and that is <laughs> before, 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 before that. Yeah. Um. Uh. It's interesting where you say that we are at this point because I was at a certain kind of point like this where um I was in college um about f- almost five years ago now, and I was doing my dis- dissertation at that time, and my dissertation was on was so here's the thing here's a lowdown, I am a uh, bachelor of business graduate for international business in the hospitality and tourism sector and my dissertation was on how technology can improve customer service or how it can be used to basically make it easier for both parties the consumer and the and the provider of the service now one of the examples i used was was a microsoft event because at that time microsoft released their uh, their future productivity video which had a lot of ui uh things that you now see in the modern modern ui and in windows 10 and windows phone and all of those things and what they are showing up what has now shown up in hololens that was already they had all the assets ready for all the things we see today at least eight years ago and they made a concept video of it uh eight years ago and i and i found that video six years ago and then i and i used it as an example um in my in my thesis for my pro- for my industry project for my dissertation and people didn't believe me mm. lo and behold six months after i shared that video the first windows phone came out with the exact same ui the exact same ui how smooth it was how how perfectly it worked everything that they showed in that video worked in that phone and uh. i and then when i had an actual panel of people for an interview to collect data they didn't believe me then. So they didn't know that I was actually listening into the interview remotely via Skype. So all of a sudden I unmute my mic and I, I'm like talking to these people in this in this really really puzzled general managers of hotels sitting in this banquet room, uh, listening to a guy who was actually doing the project, start speaking to them. And I, and I come on the screen, I go like, that's not true. And I, I just clicked on my phone and I showed it to them on Skype. I'm like it exists right now. That video I saw, it's already in my hand. So you can't really make the argument that this thing will never exist. It's just a concept. So um, it's it's just that AR is already happening where um, there are experiences uh, with AR in terms of the entertainment business uh, where people have created a laser tag with it, where you have an actual HUD over your eyes using HoloLens. Yeah, and you can you can use it, and it's just so cool. I've seen it, and I'm so happy about this because there's this new mall opening up, like a 10 minute walk from my place. I can see it from my window, and they have this huge indoor amusement park, and they have an indoor augmented reality HUD style paintball arena coming up, and I'm so so stoked for it. That's interesting. Oh, That's nice. gonna be really good. It's so good. Why like India the entry ticket stuff before I, we do. Like, because the <laughs> all of the R and D and like the prototyping happens here. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. So um. So yeah. So, Alan Rickman died. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, he did. There was there was a memorial service and a lot of different things. Um, Brandon, you are a little bit behind. Yeah, I mean, you you must have had to be under a rock. Like it was all over Nine Gag. Was all over all the websites. Like any place that shares any I think, kind of media. I had, think had I have tributary. heard. Okay, here's the thing. Yeah. You said <laughs> Okay. I didn't remember what his name was, you see. Uh-huh. So you said uh, you said Alan Rickman rests in peace. I'm still waiting uh-huh. for that GPS. And I said it's not going to happen, man, because I didn't realize who you were talking about. I then <laughs> googled him and then I was like I screamed, "Alan Rickman's dead?" <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jeez. Oh he fucking died. hell! I guess, I mean, I was I was hoping Snape wasn't dead, but 
Uh, no, I was holding out, man. I was holding out for that 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 <laughs> sequel movie with Snape. All right. I guess it's not no. going to happen. Yeah, it's, it's there is happen. a new Harry Potter movie coming out though. It's more of a prequel though, and it takes place in America, which is cool. Which is interesting as well. Hopefully, we'll see yes. some part of that universe side of things as well. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Less oh, of the American tr- muggles are called nomages. Yeah, like the oh, uh, traditional no. British style of uh, ministry, and then we'll see what the American style of. of it's um, going to be more of a corporation, isn't it? Yeah, oh, probably. I don't know. It'll be probably. very interested. Is it maybe a Senate or something? That'd be cool. I don't know. I, I don't know. Wiz- well, they already have a Senate of sorts, don't they? In, in uh, the ministry, the wisdom of God is kind of a Senate. So yeah, and it's, the, it's what the we what? call it. <laughs> what the do you what? call it? Well, we call it a minister. The, the ministers, they're all ministers, and they create a parliament. Okay, blue throat. I say wizamagat. What do you say? <laughs> the wizen gamut. Oh, <laughs> wizen, <laughs> the wizen gamut. No, I mean, yes. I think they're legitimate, both of them. I they, yeah. Maga- maga- no, they're I'm, not. They're you, not. I probably read you, it wrong. You missed a certain letters there. <laughs> yeah, I think there's bits in there that are probably not real. <laughs> Wiz and gamut. I think Maybe. in the movies they they pronounce it more like you do with like the n and the e in it. <laughs> the wisdom of God. Wiz and as, gamut. As I Maybe. Think. Maybe. Yeah. And um, the, I think they're called warlocks. Yes, they are. Uh, yeah. Any a member the, the, of the wiz and gamut is actually a warlock. Yeah. As a warlock, yeah. So um, ha ha, druid, ha ha. So, <laughs> what? What are you? Ha, I would ha, kick ha, your ha. ass in that in that Harry Potter quiz. What? Oh man, you definitely would. <laughs> I mean, but it's okay because I already know you and I already have you on Skype, so I don't need your number, Blue Throat. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you definitely Here, let's would. Take, you um, know what? While we're talking, let's take this quiz together. I, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not sure. Not you. I, not you. Oh no, it's going to change every time, so it's, it's pointless unless we're playing against each other. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, um. So um I mean we may as well like talk about like Harry Potter as well at the moment because um I can just I can just edit all of the, the different stuff out into different episodes anyway. Yeah, whatever you so like. That's all right. Um so um about Harry Potter. Um I was at the time where I had finished all the books and I was I was actually like some sub, sub, so people get worried who have read the books and when a movie is made or a series of movies is made. Mhm. They get really angry that things have changed for the screen and they can't really handle it and they and they lash out. I was one of the people who for Harry Potter were really worried for for how they would because the movies were good and I was kind of upset that they had to leave so much out of uh, the movies, especially with um, with Order of the Phoenix. There was so much information like it was such a fat book when it came out and the movie had so much left out. There was so much information that you get I about think, the universe. I think it was a mistake to release it as such a fat book. I don't know. I mean, um, I'm talking about the movies at the moment because there were so many little details that hinted at the, the real reason and the real identity of, of Snape uh, in that book. And like the, the whole... There was. And they didn't include any of it in in the movie. There's like and one scene worried. where Harry is sitting in the banister on the stairs and he looks down yes. and Snape kind of walks in and like shakes off his and coat looks... and then walks into the meeting. That's it. Yes. Yep. And there's, there's times where you like, like there, there are so many times where like the, the scenes that could have been there where Harry walks the corridors at night of Hogwarts and he's actually, he's actually almost caught by Snape so many times Yeah. <laughs> through those years. And the thing is, like the way it's written in the books, you have such a you have such an inkling that Snape can actually see him and he's not doing anything. I'm pretty Just sure like he can. Dumbledore. I'm pretty because sh- per- Snape was yeah. like after after Harry was born, Snape became Dumbledore's student. He became his like yep. his number one his right hand man, and yeah. we know that Dumbledore can see him when he's invisible. So oh yeah, Dumbledore can see him. And yeah. the thing is, no, Dumbledore actually respected Snape for his ability. Like Snape was no like. Even like Voldemort kept him close because Snape was really deadly. He knew how to like he was he was a really powerful wizard on his own. Yes. And and More there was no with way. Potions, yeah, he was very powerful with potions. And the thing is, like Dumbledore purposely didn't make him defensive against the Dark Arts teacher because he knew the curse was real. Like Voldemort had cu- had jinxed the job, had cursed the job, so that he didn't want to lose Snape. 
That's why he never got the job until he actually needed himself dead by his hands. Right. That's the year he gave him the job, the which was very is, deliberate. I think the thing is, though, that um, the whole seeing... Sorry, I'm still stuck on the seeing people while well, invisible thing. Um, that was definitely retconned. Like, if, if J.K. Rowling had known about the whole Horcruxes thing and the whole um, the Deathly Hallows thing when she was writing she the first through fifth books, I don't know. Did she? She she knew uh, after Horcrux book three. She did, definitely. The, yeah, the she knew. She Hallows, like... I don't think she did. No, the Hallows, uh, I don't know about the details, but she knew about Snape specifically. Right. Um, she knew his outcome. She knew Dumbledore's outcome. Like, by the time book three came out, she knew the whole story arc um, till the end. Like, who would die? And My point and, like, is, though, that particular invisibility cloak should be unpierceable. Oh, yeah. Do you see what I mean? Nobody, yeah, yeah. I don't care who you are and how powerful you are. Nobody should be able to see you while you're using that cloak. Yeah. At, unless, unless that's the thing. Because um, the cloak was meant to fool death, right? Yes. And nobody could, could see the person on the, underneath the cloak. And it never wore but off. It, it would never wore off. And the thing is, you might not actually need to see the person inside. You just need to know the presence of another human being. Perhaps. Maybe they can sniff Because you them. can't... <laughs> yeah, you you can tell if somebody's concealed in a place. You just can't find them. You can and, tell if somebody's concealed. And maybe yeah. the fact that Dumbledore knew that he had the hollow, and perhaps Snape knew that he had the hollow. Maybe knowing, maybe knowing they couldn't mm -hmm. see him because this was a better cloak. Maybe and yeah. there's only one of those. Maybe that's how they knew who he was. But because I think for any other student that had an invisibility cloak and was walking through the hall, Snape would have been like, "Hey, you're right here." Do you know what I mean? Do, do you not yeah, think yeah, yeah. that? Did they not say that the invisibility cloak was, you know, rip, like it's so expensive beyond measure, though, that nobody else would essentially afford one? They did, but that doesn't mean that nobody had mm. one. No, I that's mean, look true. At, I'm not look saying at how that, rich but... some of the Slytherins were. Yeah, you know? no, I, yeah. Um... No, the Dumbledore knew what it was in in the second year because he was the one who gave it to Harry. Right. He had it all the time. He had he had the cloak and he knew what it was. And actually, Dumbledore um, Dumbledore showed his hand in the first movie. Well, yeah, in the first movie. I'm not sure he did in the first. I think he, Harry took off his cloak in the first book. But in the first movie, um, Harry is standing in front of the mirror of Erised with the cloak on, and Dumbledore walks in and goes, "I see you found the mirror of Erised." Yeah, <laughs> arised. Well, it's Erised. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's the name so yeah, so like I was, I was really worried about how they would figure out because, cause like the seventh book was already out and they just made the fifth movie, um, and we all knew that it had to be that way. And I was just imagining how panicked the studio was and the screenwriters were to like if because they had to like actually make out Snape to be the good guy in the end and how all of the details that they had chose to leave out of the fifth movie they would cover up in the sixth one so i was waiting so anxiously for the sixth movie to see if they what they did so, how how did yeah. they repair the damage so what they did was alan rickman didn't let them do it if you if you read what he said about what he said about the um the harry potter books and things is he was allowed to read the seventh book before the sixth was filmed and the fifth was filmed so he was like yeah. snape wouldn't do that because oh. yeah. these following reasons, and I can't do this. I'm sorry. Uh, this is not the better one. To, yeah, it's such a brilliant actor, but very clever, very perceptive of J.K. Rowling that she was like, somebody needs to know to make sure this doesn't happen. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And he gets constantly <laughs> was, prepared, yeah. prepared. You know, like the. And he was kind of a secret main character throughout the entire series up until. Not the very book. much so. Yeah. Like nobody yeah. realized how important he was, and then in the seventh book. In movie you finally realize oh shit this is actually snape is actually a main character in this series <laughs> and that's not something that yeah. you're able to hide usually do you know what i mean like yeah yeah usually they open also, up very early yeah. about that but uh there were so many characters that weren't in the movies at all that had so much to do with 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 uh with the actual main story yeah um like like the people like diag and ali like every person that harry ever meets Except for just like, because they only showed Ollivander and Griphook uh, in the movies, but like the ice cream parlor is completely missing. It is. Um, I think he's sitting outside of it in the movies, but they don't like say anything about it. 
Yeah, they don't say anything about it. Um, um, they never show Madame Malkins. They never show um, uh, the guy from Flourish and Bots. The they show the, the, or the lady. They show the, the store, but only in the second one to introduce yeah. Peter and Lockhart. Yeah, and those those places like they have the 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 <laughs> the person who works at the the three broomsticks was yeah. is also a really interesting person and it's just like there's so many characters that have that carry so much weight on their own it's just amazing yeah and they have their own stories and everything you're referring of course to tom of the three of the no no todd rooms. i think todd tom Todd, Tom, or Todd? The three groups. Six and Diagonally. Maybe Tom, but yeah. Um, and then mm. there's stuff that they added in too. The big one that everybody always points to is actually in the Three Broomsticks in the third book, a movie rather. Um, the the cleaning lady that walks up to the door and she opens it and then the monster yeah. goes, ah! <laughs> and she just stands there yeah. like, "All right then." <laughs> yep. Yeah. I'll come back later. <laughs> it was funny. It was funny, but it didn't really it fit into the universe, did it? Yeah, it does. But the thing is, like, that was the third movie. Uh, the third movie was off the rocker because because who New the director, director was. Yeah. yeah, it was it was Alfonso Cuaron, the guy who made Gravity. And um, he is he he like if you see the documentary about like the making of the movie, um, he actually added like a lot of the the music into the movie. Like it wasn't actually in the script, and he, he pushed a to have the like, movie. Yeah. Well, like it feels the third more atmospheric. Was probably the darkest of them. Yeah, yeah, it's um, very, yeah. very atmospheric though that movie. It, yeah, there's okay. a very, very perceptible change as a child as well. Like you're yeah. watching, if you w- sit down to watch all of the movies, it's like first movie, hey, second movie, hey, third movie, what the fuck just happened? Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then yeah, they kind of toned really down dark, the really darkness fast, a bit. Yeah. yeah, and they toned down the darkness a bit for the fourth and on, but um, yeah, it was really weird. <laughs> It was so drastic. Like you go to watch the movie, like what happened? Yeah, <laughs> somebody like so, like I was yeah. like a lot of people thought what like because I was one of the first people who like at that time I was a kid and really didn't really didn't notice like I didn't care who the director was and why the movie is so drastically different. But then you learn about like directors as you watch more of their movies and you grow up, so you start you you see the patterns. And the first person I thought was. Did Zack Snyder direct this movie? <laughs> and I was like, no, wait, <laughs> no. Uh-huh. And I was like, oh, okay, it was Alfonso Cuaron, okay. And then now it makes more sense. Yeah, it's just <laughs> very like grey and atmospheric and things. It's just you know the outside shots are, are a lot. You know, there's less. Yeah. You know, happiness to the whole yeah. movie. I think it is very well mm-hmm. rounded. It's certainly my favorite one that I saw. Which one was? Yeah, artistically, it's such the a good, it's such one. good cinematography that movie. Oh. Yeah, I just wish if like if if they could have had Alfonso Cuaron for the last, like for the fifth movie and the last movie, if Alfonso Cuaron had done those two movies, yeah, they would have been so much more epic. I think he definitely set it down show. a path, though. And I think that yeah. even yeah. just having him for that one movie did set it down a good path. Yeah, um, David Gates I mean, finished off the last uh, four, I think. Last four, yeah. David, so, he did a good job. That's yeah. fine. It was Mike Newell for Goblet of Fire, which was a good movie. Uh, I think it might mm-hmm. be one of the best movies, actually, in my opinion. But I don't know. That's just my opinion. I, oh, I really, the... I don't remember them at all. And I, like I said, I don't think I've seen the last two. I don't think so. Yeah. Um. Uh, the seventh one is okay. Yeah. It'd be. <laughs> yeah, I think exactly I just need I to said. probably just need to rewatch <laughs> them and and reenjoy them and and just take yeah. them at face value. I think is the key to it. I think as well. Like, I do think there was a mistake though. They in the last one. No, no. In all, in actually, it was the fourth and onward. Uh huh. And they didn't have John Williams anymore as the music director. Yes, that was a big mistake. Yeah. Yep. They, they went to Patrick Doyle um, and then a couple others. They kind of bounced between different music directors after that. But mm-hmm. um, John Williams was the director for the first three. So yes, he may have actually yeah. decided himself that he didn't want to be a part of it anymore after the third movie. Um, I'm not really yeah. sure how that happened. but Probably. I mean, they probably had... It's Warner Brothers, so you never know what's happening right. under the sheets. So No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> um.